Hello, Ryan here and welcome to Star Citizen Sunday. This is a weekly show which covers all of the news from the week just past. Be sure to subscribe if you like what you see and let's get on with it. This week, we hear more regarding the FPS changes coming in Alpha 323 and beyond. We check out the character customizer and all that comes with it. There is a new Overdrive initiative event, plus Cloud Imperium are heavily teasing creatures. So before we get to it, there were no new tech preview, server meshing and jump point tests since last weekend. They are taking all of the data that they gathered during those tests and now just working through that with hopefully a new test coming sometime next week. However, there is a new 4 hour Alpha 323 patch to test for the Eva Cati, which is a feature test as well, not just a stability test. And the features include the new character customizer, EVA tier 2, the new loot screens, visor updates, dynamic crosshairs, reloading changes, physical shopping, whatever that is, and the replication layer server crash recovery. Now, that to me looks like they are aiming to release the replication layer separation for the initial release of 323, so not just in a 323.x build, which will be an absolute win for this patch on top of everything else that's coming. And it would also indicate that if they do implement the replication layer separation, then Fauna might be more of an actual guarantee for 323, as the creatures might behave as intended. I'm sure we will learn more as the patch goes live, but that is a great way to end the week, and I can't wait to see what the results are of Alpha 323's feature test. So this week's Inside Star Citizen was all about the upcoming character creator for Alpha 323. Now they say the character creator in Star Citizen is so important as it gives ownership over the player's avatar in game, and they want the player to fully represent themselves in the Star Citizen universe. Also, do note the first clip we see of the character removing their helmet, which is coming soon, I feel, as they have just batch updated many helmets to be able to do this. So, fingers firmly crossed that we can take our helmets off in 323. Anyway, for the character customizer in Alpha 323, it is broken into four main sections, starting with the DNA system, although do notice as well, there are actually five tabs, with the first one being body type. They do want players to eventually have the choice of body, be that thinner, fatter, amongst other options, but it looks like it might not be coming with 323 unless they are surprising us with that, and these won't allow extremities in either way. As metrics apply, the players need to be able to fit in their chairs, to be able to see over dashboards, so we will have some variation, but it won't be extreme like you would see in a game like Ark or something along those lines. Anyway, for the DNA section, this is where the player can blend and shape the face that they want, moving through the various head options, which there are a lot more available now, but also sculpt the face, where you can grab a node on the face and sort of pull it in the direction that you want to go to shape it how you would like. Now, in this section, you can also adjust the skin tone and texture with a wide range of skin shades, freckles, blemishes, plus they have even more scanned faces to come in the future, so what we have for 323 will expand. The next section is for the hair, with a whole load of new hairstyles with this nice physics simulation to it as well. There are beards, other facial hair options, eyebrows. Really happy to see beards finally coming along, and there looks to be quite a decent range of them as well. Uh, you also have a load of new different colour options for your hair, from natural colour blending, dye options and gradients for multiple hair locations and how much of the hair is coloured at the tips or the roots and you can have either or or both at the same time. Uh, plus they did say there will be a lot more hairstyles in the future as well. The next section is called features and this is for things like makeup for the eyes, cheeks and lips with a whole range of colour and effects choices like gloss, opacity and so on and so forth. And then the final section is the review page, where you can see your final character as a whole. Now, probably one of the biggest features for the customizer, for this new customizer, is the option to save and load, which allows players to save what looks to be multiple character designs that you can then load in and out when you want them, but also export your design and share that with other people in the community. So you can essentially design characters for other people, which is pretty cool. So if you are quite talented 
at creating life like people, you know, like people of the, of the community or the devs, you can share that file around and people can use it. Uh, also, this means when there is a reset, we are not having to completely start again from scratch, which is a massive win. Now, the CIG devs also use this same tool to help update all of the NPCs, so the population around the verse is going to look a lot more believable, realistic, and have all these different variations attached to them as well. And Jared did say that tattoos, scars, and piercings are on the way, but these will come post 323, so not for the initial release. Which I'm very happy to hear about that they are on the way, but a shame it is not in 323 itself. Now, it is pretty clear to see the range of customization we have for the new character customizer in 323 is pretty phenomenal. They are certainly some of the best looking characters I have seen in any game, and they're not done yet. But also, it is going to be wonderful being able to save our characters. Uh, also, before they ended, a phone was held up with another tease of creatures. This time, kind of a bird-style pterodactyl flying creature that looked like they might be open to attacking players and NPCs, but CIG are hinting more and more to creatures, and if I was to guess, I presume they're coming in 323, because we also saw, as I've probably mentioned already, I don't know if I have, there was a tease of a cave dog style animal on RSI socials, so I think it is safe to say the PU is going to get a lot more dangerous and a lot more interesting from 323 onwards. Anyway, with that said, that is Inside Star Citizen. Let us move on. So this week's Star Citizen Live was a Q&A with members of the FPS team who we met and heard from on a recent Inside Star Citizen. The first question for them was about the sniper scope glint, why it is there, how does it work, and who will see it. So they say that sniper glint occurs when someone is aiming down sights and only if it is aimed at you at a specific angle. So there is a minor glint and direct glint, minor glint being on a wider angle, but when aimed directly at you, the glint is increased. This is done to balance out how powerful snipers are, as they can one-hit kill you in the head, and the cost of death in Star Citizen, of course, is pretty high. So they want to provide a bit of feedback to help balance things out. Now, they are planning to remove the auto-zeroing from all scopes as well, while increasing the zeroing increments so that you have to focus more on landing your shot. They are also working more on the scopes in terms of their abilities, like altering their fields of views, to allow for more differences between manufacturers, so some might have different multipliers on them, some will have different glint angles, uh, so that we have more of a choice as to what scope we want to use. Now, they did say that the glint in Star Citizen is a lot less obvious than in other games, plus it will vary from scope to scope, which we of course didn't see because we saw a one second <laughs> snippet of the potential glint. And I have to admit, I did jump to conclusions about that, Hopefully, once we get it in our hands, it'll make a bit more sense. But after hearing this, I am a little more open to the idea of glint. Of course, I would prefer to have no glint at all, but I understand that in a game with such a powerful weapon, there needs to be a balance. I also hope that when they release binoculars, they don't have glint as they are not a dangerous tool. So we can at least zoom in on our targets and gather the information that we require when doing, say, reconnaissance without revealing ourselves. Also, the idea of removing the auto zeroing in I am a big fan of, giving players wanting to use snipers the chance to practice and get good and be rewarded for that practice, rather than just anyone being able to pick up a sniper rifle and hit a target straight away from a certain distance. So that I feel is a really good move, and it will be great being able to use a proper sniper spotter combo, having one player calling out targets and the range so that the sniper just has to think about zeroing in and hitting the shot. Next question, also relating to glint, is will it work at night? And he says that regardless of lighting conditions, the glint is present, as it is, again, more of a game balance. They are aware that this is not usually how it works in the real world, so if anyone is open to an alternative idea for this potential glint system, please do suggest it to them. They really want snipers to be powerful and reward that style of gameplay, but it is a game and death is a big consequence, so it needs to be balanced. But again, they ask that we give it a go and see how it feels. So yeah, of course it makes no sense to having glint on a scope at nighttime. There's no light source to create that. Uh, and I get that they are trying to make a game, 
balance needs to be considered. The cost of death is big, but I am certainly happy to hear that they are open to suggestions on better approaches, as this is really one aspect of Star Citizen that helps it stand out from other games. It is how the community can play a big role in improving the experience. And on a side note, they are also aware that right now, the game doesn't have a lot of post-sniper shot feedback, like muzzle flash, tracers, audio, and so on, which will come along eventually, but they don't want players to just sit and shoot for no other reason than I'm just going to sit here and kill everyone. The next question is, won't Sniper Glint just encourage quickscoping? And they say no, because they are also increasing the Sniper ADS time to the aim down sight, so it takes longer to pull your weapon up to aim uh, and have a bigger hip fire recoil as well. Sniper rifle recoil and spread is also getting adjusted, so no scoping is really not going to be possible. And I am, again, happy to hear this as there should be strengths and weaknesses and scenarios as to when to use a particular weapon versus a different one. And running around in close quarters is not the ideal solution for sniper rifles. So really good to hear that there is more tuning for sniper rifles to make them more suited to the role they play in the real world, while also addressing things like post sniper shot, which could see the reduction or even a potential removal of scope glint if they have more indication as to where a shot came from. Now, anyway, next question is, do any of the changes to scopes impact the clipping with armor? And they say they are investigating this. It is an armor issue, and they plan on releasing a temporary fix in 323, which isn't the best fix, but they are working on a permanent solution in the future. Uh, and the patch after 323 is more likely to receive this permanent solution. But if they can get a temporary fix in now, that is better than nothing because it is a nightmare when aiming down sights or through a scope and your armor blocks the full view. Next question, are there plans for more grenade types? And yes, they have a lot of plans for different grenades. Squadron 42 already has things like smoke grenades, flash grenades, stun grenades, maybe even concussion grenades, I think they said. But they do plan on more sci-fi grenades as well and other FPS devices too. They are currently playing around with different ideas for how a flash, stun, or concussion grenade would work, especially when balancing for PvP, like the angles of where the grenade goes off, so right in front of your face versus to a peripheral 90 degree angle. They're also playing with the immediate and post effects and how it all ties to the player's health systems, like how it impacts the player's eyes and the after effects. For smoke grenades, they want to work out how long the smoke should last and so on. There is a lot of balance needed for what we have in Squadron with PvE versus PvP and Star Citizen. They're not planning to reinvent the wheel with these grenades. They will act as you would expect, but I suppose there is a lot of potential here for what they can do to balance these impacts. And I'm really excited to see these types of grenades come along. They will certainly help add to the verse and to FPS in all levels. So very excited to see that. Uh, but for the more sci-fi grenade types, they want to have things like area of denial options and grenades. Uh, and in the past, we have seen potential incendiary EMP grenades. And there is a ton of potential here as well for a whole range of options. Now, next question is, are there any plans to replace the current percentage of health that we have with a more immersive option like heart rate or blood pressure? Now, they are doing stuff related around medical gameplay at the moment uh, in regards to things like injuries, doing a balance pass to help tell more of a story as to what you have or this, the character has personally gone through. They're also working on improving the pre-down state as they are moving away from reviving people with the generic med pen, the hemazal pen, and instead having a specific pen to do this with. Uh, but they also want to give players who enter a pre-down state the option to at least crawl to safety so they can be revived. Although the ability to crawl, they did say, won't allow you to crawl forever. It will be for a small duration for you to maybe get to a safer position, which would be a great idea, especially if you've been hit by a sniper and you are still vulnerable to that sniper getting a kill shot on you. You can at least crawl to safety where you are out of the firing line. There is also a new health app coming to the Moby Glass, which we will see in a couple of weeks on Inside Star Citizen giving more health detail to your character. Now, in regards to the medical profession, they have said in the past that they want players to be diagnosing ailments and triaging situations heavily based on visual and audible feedback. So hearing characters coughing or wheezing might help to determine a treatment. Or, of course, visually seeing damage to a character, like bleeding and such, 
which hopefully over time, they will be a lot more visceral with the medical system, allowing you to treat different injuries differently. But they have also spoken about quarantining and viruses. So they have big plans for expanding the medical profession. Uh, and do remind me if I haven't linked it already, the passenger transport post that they wrote in 2015 in regards to maybe acting as a doctor on board of a Starliner, treating symptoms uh, and so on, as that gives a bit of an insight into the direction they want to get to. But of course, getting to that point will probably take a bit of time. Now, the next question is, when it comes to ammo repooling, are you defining different ammo across different types of weapons, like rifles, pistols, shotguns, and so on? Or will ammo be bespoke to each magazine? Now, it will be bespoke to each weapon's ammo, so repooling a P4 ammo won't work with other ammo types. They won't be repooled together. Also, for the first iteration, you will only be able to repool the ammo for the weapon that you have in your hand. In the future, they will see where to go from here. Plus, in 3.23, we will be able to trigger repooling from the inventory, not just while in-game uh, interacting with the backpack. Now, for energy weapons in 3.23, they will also work the same way as ballistic ammo for the time being, but long-term, energy weapons will be able to regenerate. This is not for 323, but eventually for items and guns with batteries, like an energy weapon, these will be rechargeable on certain armor suits once the armor suits get the resource network applied, which some of you might not know uh, is to be the thing. So armor will need power, and this will basically help trickle charge certain magazines. The future for ballistic versus ammo beyond 323, they say is that ballistics are finite, they will do more damage, they will be able to be repooled versus energy weapons which can be recharged, but they do less damage. They maybe have a longer distance of travel before dropping off, but they will also have an overheat function and much more. There is going to be a lot of variation between them, so making the decision on what we use will be more apparent in the future. And I also do still hope that they address energy weapon recoil to be a part of that balance where it is either reduced or non-existent for certain weapons, for certain energy weapons versus ballistic. Next question is, will we be able to cancel or prevent reloading? And they say, yes, you will be able to cancel the reloading or repooling process. Uh, will there be any reason to use a laser attachment with the new dynamic crosshair? And they say, yes, absolutely. There are situations that you might not be wearing a combat helmet. Different armor helmets will give good reason to use a laser pointer for their associated gameplay, like mining, salvage, medical, exploration, and so much more. So situations where you won't be wearing a combat helmet, so you won't get that dynamic crosshair, and you will benefit greatly from having a laser pointer attached. Plus, they will create more situations to warrant using a laser pointer. I think in multi-crew, having a laser pointer is, is definitely a good benefit, because you can use it to point out targets or designate targets. Uh, they are also branching off from the combat armor types to provide more non-combat armor types as well. So giving more contextual information for these helmets as well. For example, a bounty hunting specialist helmet might allow for a longer range ping. A mining helmet would provide more information about the rock you're looking at and what might be required to mine it. Or for a medic, maybe showing vital signs or injuries that a player may have sustained. Even a visor hood will be different between these, these helmets, giving a lot more information, which I am a huge fan of and cannot wait to see. Uh, now, will we have crosshair options like the size, the shape, the color? And they say later down the line, they don't see why not, but it's not a priority right now. However, they have looked into adding an option for an opacity slider so that you can change how much you see or don't see the crosshair itself. Of course, you can turn it off as well. Uh, now, will shooting specific gear destroy an item or maybe explosions destroy your gear in the future? And they say, yes, damage will apply in various ways, like usage, direct damage, overheating, the environment. These will all impact your items in various ways. Uh, they are keen that an explosion will impact the level of wear and damage localized to the items closer to where the explosion happened. And the same applies for dirt. For example, if you're walking through a swampy environment versus sprinting through a swampy environment, sprinting will increase the amount of dirt that applies to your items and suits. Uh, same goes for walking and crawling and so on. Really like where this is leading, making better decisions in the situation, having to problem solve, 
and think about do I go through the swamp or do I go around it to maintain your gear. These sorts of aspects will just reward so much from combat to exploration and everything in between. Next question, will we see a ballistic shield in the future? And yes, they have worked on a ballistic shield for Squadron, but no dates as to when this will come to the Persistent Universe, but they will try to push to get it in for 323 or shortly after. Uh, will we see binoculars? And this is on the list of gadgets they want, but not immediate future, uh, but it will come eventually. I would love to see that list of what gadgets they want. Again, they can have real world gadgets plus sci-fi gadgets. I know they have plans for a lot of other options, but seeing that list would be great. Uh, next question is, what ammo variants are planned? Now, they don't speak about ballistic ammo, but for energy types, they have plans for a better plasma implementation with damage over time effects and maybe having it more volatile than energy weapons. Tachyon ammo as well is an idea, so faster than light ammunition, but will need to be well balanced. Kind of same goes for neutron ammo. Uh, does this become more powerful the further it travels? Plus, we saw the vault weapons, which have a heat management beam style ammo. Uh, so a lot of options, and they will introduce a lot of this cool sci-fi stuff as time goes on. But again, the, the potential here is huge. We have our conventional choice, which you would expect, but then sci-fi, traditional sci-fi, you know, conventional sci-fi, and then even further than that, there is no limitations. Next question, will it be possible to equip weapons with civilian clothing? Now, they really want this and have been discussing the potentials here and they really want to utilize the clothing sets more. You can do it somewhat now, but it's not fully supported. We may see things like magnetic plates, holsters for clothing and whatnot. So a lot to work out there, but again, huge potential and very excited to see what can come from this. Now, the next question is, is there plans to make weapons follow recoil patterns? And they say each weapon does have a recoil pattern with minor amounts of variation, but each weapon does have a unique recoil pattern itself. For 323, they have refined these patterns to make them a little smoother, not super noticeable, but in the sense of improving firing at range. Uh, they also are looking at magazine sizes, damage fall off, and a lot more. For sliding, this isn't coming in 323. Uh, they are aware of a lot of concerns about sliding making Star Citizen feel very arcadey, and they don't want that to be the case. It is a movement that is used primarily to get you to cover, so it'll have a high stamina cost. You can't fire or enter aiming down sights while going into a slide. It is a committed defense action, which they say they want to make it make sense to the Star Citizen universe and will provide more details as it comes closer to releasing. But I'm really happy to hear that sliding is not going to be an arcadey gimmick, but I would still love to see an option to dive to the ground forwards. So if you are running um, to cover, for example, and you suddenly come under fire, I would love to be able to get to the ground as soon as possible and get my head out of the firing line immediately. So I hope that they consider the ability to just dive forwards, kind of nose dive. Next question is, what is your stance on force reactions in regards to gunfights? And they say they have toned down the force reactions for 322 and are looking into removing staggering off of all FPS weapons, but still keep flinching in. And of course, grenades will potentially knock you down. They are aware that these staggers are a big pain point for FPS, so they are looking into it. Next question, how will shotguns be made more relevant? Now, they are doing a big balance in 323 as they have taken a lot of feedback about damage profiles and shotguns will bring the pain. They will be very powerful. They don't want to make them overpowered, but things like tighter spreads to improve accuracy at distance is something they want to look into. Uh, other improvements will include changes to things like the railgun and the grenade launchers in PvP scenarios they will become stronger. But of course, uh, in my opinion, a lot of balance needs to happen here because we don't want people running around railgunning everybody. Next question is, what are the challenges remaining to get FPS in Star Citizen feeling less alpha and more akin to that of a modern FPS shooter? So although what they speak about here is not really challenges anymore, they, they still want to work out the scopes and armor being, you know, clipping through, but improving sprinting and general overall movement and how that feels is important to them. They want it to feel more real and have a bit more punishing effects by the sounds of things where if you're sprinting, it's a committed action. It's going to feel more like a real world example rather than a, an arcadey game. Uh, tracers and more medical improvements they want. Muzzle flashes. 
more weapon stat improvements to make weapons feel more like the weapons they are supposed to be as well, uh, plus improving the player clunkiness and smoothing out the weapon firing and recoil, the combat HUD improvements, all of this stuff is either in the works or completed and will make Star Citizen feel much more polished and like a modern FPS shooter. <sighs> anyway, I'm really happy to hear about all of these updates and I feel like they are more aware than I realised about what Star Citizen's FPS is supposed to be. And they are not just making a copy of another game like a COD arcade feel. So very glad to hear about their thoughts in these areas and I'm really excited to try these in 323, see how different it is, and then of course improve on that, build from that with all the different variations that they can alter things and bring in new styles. Uh, so yeah, a great at Star Citizen Live. A long one, I do apologize, there's a lot to be said there, but some great information that I, I feel like I needed to hear. Uh, also, next week's Inside Star Citizen is all about the cargo and hangar updates, which is gonna be one of the best episodes, I'm sure. So excited to see and learn more about the cargo profession. Whew, can't wait for that one. Anyway, let us move on. So also this week, there was a new Whiteley's guide taking a closer look at the Origin 890 Jump Super Yacht. Squadron 42's monthly report was released, which I have already covered in a separate video linked below. And for those wondering where my PU monthly report coverage video is, it is on the way, and hopefully I can get it out sometime this next week. It's also St. Patrick's Day this week, or Stella Fortuna, as it is known somewhat in the verse. So there are new skins and coins to attain. We had a new letter from the chairman, which if you have yet to read it, be sure to check out my video covering it, as it is a huge deal. Highlighting Cloud Imperium's plans on moving from an alpha through 4.0 and beta, and then getting Star Citizen to a version 1.0 release candidate. This year and next is going to be pretty monumental for Star Citizen, so do follow the link below if you would like to learn more. And finally, there is a new series of missions called the Overdrive Initiative, in which over the next few weeks, players will complete these series of missions to unlock the option to upgrade their civilian Hornet F7C Mark II to the militarized F7A version for free, provided, of course, you have bought the F7C. Hopefully, there will be other rewards for playing through outside of spending real money, but I am yet to take part in this, and I do look forward to taking part in this event, irrespective of that reward, as it's good to get more of these sort of gameplay missions involved, and hopefully on stream we'll get to jump in together and do it together. Uh, this also means that the new Hornet F7C Mark II is now on sale, and it does look very sexy. Again, I will try and check it out on stream sometime this week. So do hop over there if you are interested to check it out together. So that brings us to the end of the show. If you do enjoy my content, please consider subscribing and hitting that like button. Also, I am able to do this thanks to my very generous patrons and channel members. If you appreciate what I do and would like to help make it even better from as little as $1 a month, all of the links are provided below.